Thanks, everyone. I think we're going we're gonna to get started. Thank you all for being here. I'm Larry Schwartztoll. I'm the Executive Director of the Criminal Justice Program of Study, Research, and Advocacy here at the Law School. Um, welcome to the third session of the speaker series that we have been hosting over the last couple months, Race, Place, and Policing, What We Can Learn from Baltimore. Um, I'll say just very briefly that what we've been trying to do with the speaker series is think about how issues surrounding policing and racial justice and policing are connected to broader structural issues of access to opportunity. And uh, our aim in the speaker series has been to structure a conversation to really look at how those threads interconnect. Um, I know some of you were able to attend the first two sessions, the first with Jason Downs, the second with Cheryl and Eiffel. For folks who weren't able to attend, uh, video of those sessions is available on the criminal justice programs website. Uh, so the URL to find those videos is cjp.law.harvard.edu slash events. Um, we have two more events in, as part of the speaker series after today. On February 23rd, we will be joined by Andre Alonzo, who is currently a professor of practice in the Graduate School of Education here at Harvard. Uh, he was previously the CEO of the Baltimore City Schools. And then on September 29th, we're hosting a capstone panel where we're going to be bringing together people advocating on policing and all of the structural issues surrounding policing in Baltimore. The idea of that is going to be to talk about different modes of advocacy, different advocacy strategies, and different ways to think about um, how lawyers and people with legal training can be a part of that. Um, we have a really wonderful, diverse group of people that will be participating in that panel. Um, Sonia Kumar, who's an ACLU lawyer, Tawanda Jones and Davon Love, who are community leaders and activists in Baltimore, Natalie Finneger from the Public Defender's Office, State Delegate Alonzo Washington, uh, and Douglas Colbert, who's a professor at the University of Maryland. Um, we are very excited uh, to be joined today by Matt Hill. Matt is an attorney at the Public Justice Center where he leads the Human Right to Housing Project. Matt has been engaged in many issues uh, uh, advocating for uh, access to fair housing opportunity in and around Baltimore. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I think I just want to start off with an, an image uh, that's not on the PowerPoint. Um, but if you read um, Ta-Nehisi Coates's uh, book, The Beautiful Struggle, um, you'll see this image, and it just came to my mind when I was thinking about this issue, issue of housing and policing. And it's the one where he talks about growing up um, and being in middle school and wanting to go to school every day, and how trying to get to school was just a minefield. It was a minefield of gangs and drugs and blight and how he had to wait for his friends to come by his house and meet up with them in an exact moment so that he's never caught walking to school alone. Um, his friends and he had to put on a really hard face. They had to be very tough. They couldn't show any weakness uh, because literally, as he described it, showing weakness, being alone, uh, meant you were going to you know, get at least beaten up, possibly put in even, even greater physical danger. Um, and I remember myself in middle school, and I think, wow, middle school was incredibly hard, just being in middle school and not having to deal with any of that stuff, um, between the, the cliques and math. Um, I was just overwhelmed. I just can't imagine how we create uh, a neighborhood in the richest country in the world, and not just a neighborhood, but, you know, thousands of neighborhoods across the country where middle schoolers, instead of being protected by the police from that kind of brutality, have to go through that every day. Um, so the question is, why? Why are neighborhoods like that? Why do we have this issue in the richest country in the world in um, 2016? Um, and I think that the answer is not all just in sociology or psychology or economics um, or you know, the hard sciences. I think what really explains these things to me is a lot about history. And so we're just gonna look about 20 images of uh, history in Baltimore and the Baltimore metro area 
and talk a little bit about how that's led to the situation that we're in, um, and then some of the advocacy opportunities that all of you as lawyers are one day going to have, and I hope that you take advantage of um, and add to and build on. Um, so let's move from there. First, we're going to talk about, uh, this is, so this is our roadmap. We're going to talk about de jure segregation, uh, then forced displacement, plunder, and then again, the advocacy opportunities. De jure segregation. Baltimore um, is a pioneer in segregation. Um, they actually invented, uh, discovered, put into place, whatever you want to call it, the first racial zoning ordinance in the country. Uh, what do I mean by racial zoning? Uh, basically, they passed a law that said blacks cannot move to white blocks and whites cannot move to African American blocks. Um, this created quite a bit of a problem when you already had more than one race living on the same block. Um, uh, and that's one of the reasons the law was eventually struck down. Uh, but it was passed in the name of public health and safety, and it was hailed by progressives at a time as a way to keep racial harmony and improve the public health. Uh, it was challenged. Uh, Baltimore's also had one of the most active um, uh, African American organizing presences in the country. The first uh, chapter, local chapter of the NAACP was actually in Baltimore. Um, and the gentleman, uh, let's see if you can see him right over here, George McMeacham, uh, through the NAACP actually challenged that uh, racial zoning, zoning ordinance. He was represented by uh, uh, an African American lawyer, one of the few in Maryland at the time, named William Ashby Hawkins. Um, and they were successful in court. They kept, created the right test case. He moved into a white block and the court eventually struck down the law as being impermissibly vague on due process grounds and also uh, taking away your property rights. Um, if you're a legal history scholar at all, you know this is the era of the court where due process means let's protect everyone's private property. And so this zoning ordinance violated your, your right to do with your property as you will and to sell it to who you want to. But again, that was struck down not too long after it started in 1910 and was replaced with um, an equally pernicious sort of um, de jure segregation. Anybody want to read the uh, caption there for me and tell me what you think this might refer to? This is a Baltimore Sun article back in, um, oh gosh, I think the 1920s. But uh, anybody, this is going to be an interactive session. So we're, we're going to have to, we're going to institute the, uh, what do you call that? We just call on people cold? Cold call. No, there's a, there's a name for it. Socratic method. We're going to institute that if we, if, we, if we don't start. So who wants to at least read the, the caption for us? To protect minorities. Thank you. There you go. What do you, does anyone know what this is referring to? I'm sorry, I heard it over here. Restrict racially restrictive covenants. That's right. So you put a clause in the deed from the uh, buyer to the seller saying that you can never resell this house to an African American. This was legal in the United States until 1948 um, when the Supreme Court struck it down in a case called Shelley v. Kramer. But up until 1948, you're creating entire neighborhoods that have deeds that say this house can never be resold to an African American person. Um, and it created a number of white enclaves. They're called Roland Park, um, uh, Homeland, Northwood. And we'll look at a little bit later where those enclaves are today. But just remember that that's a very effective tool that was sanctioned by law and enforced by law all the way up through 1948. Another tool of uh, segregation was public housing. This is the McCullough Homes in Baltimore. Public housing in Baltimore was segregated all the way up through the Fair Housing Act. Um, the uh, McCullough, Douglas, and Poe homes were African American. The uh, Latrobe and Perkins homes were white. Um, and the practice was to place all of the African American public housing into uh, primarily African American neighborhoods. Um, and the same with, with the white housing. This accelerated after World War II and the severe shortage of housing for um, those folks working in, in the factories. Now, all this, of course, is supposed to end with the passage of the um, Fair Housing Act in 1968, um, just days after the, the riots that ensued after, after uh, Martin Luther King's assassination. Um, and as we know, the, the Fair Housing Act goes beyond just prohibiting discrimination based on race. 
Uh, intentional discrimination also ban disparate impact. So in other words, you have a law or a policy that has a disparate impact on a protected group, um, such as African Americans. Um, it also required HUD to affirmatively further fair housing. This is a key tool that we use today in uh, fair housing advocacy. HUD and all of its grantees, and guess what? We are all taking money from HUD, is supposed to affirmatively further fair housing in all of your um, housing and community development policies. So case closed, we passed a law in 1968. Everything's great, right? That ended segregation, ended discrimination in America. We can all go home. Um, let's, let's, let's look at that, uh, because it, it, it didn't. Um, at the end of 1969, one year after the Fair Housing Act, 95% uh, of all low and moderate rental housing um, financed by HUD was located in, in Baltimore City. By 1990, 2000, very little had changed. 90% uh, of all public housing was in Baltimore City. 70% of all HUD-assisted housing throughout the region was in Baltimore City. And they were primarily in African-American neighborhoods. So you see the darker shades uh, on this map uh, correspond with a higher concentration of African-Americans. Generally, as you'll see in the maps that we'll look through later, uh, the west side of Baltimore, uh, heavily African-American, and that particular concentration on the east side, heavily African-American. Um, and here you'll see a map of the public housing. The, all the um, green dots are the larger public housing projects. The yellow dots are what we call scattered site public housing. Um, can anyone uh, just, if I haven't already spilled the beans, what's the pattern here that you're seeing? There we go, segregation, but draw it out a little bit. Help, help me, where's all the public housing located? So you're seeing all the public housing in the areas that are predominantly black. And Cor correct, correct. And that's because, in large part, white areas were very, um, they, very did, they did well resisting, they successfully resisted all public housing being placed in their neighborhoods. There were mass demonstrations whenever the city uh, had any sort of plan to place any sort of subsidized housing in a white neighborhood. When we talked about the racially restricted covenant neighborhoods, let's look at where those were. Okay, there's uh, Guilford and Homeland, Roland Park up here. Um, very successful in uh, still, even in 2000 when this map was created, um, basically keeping out African American people, keeping out uh, HUD subsidized housing. Let's talk about other than de jure segregation, another um, aspect of how we end up in the situation that we're in today, forced displacement. Um, so here we have an image of, of, of what forced displacement looks like. Uh, the, the tool that, w the, the euphemism that was used a lot was urban renewal, okay? Started in the 1950s. Um, basically, let's renew the city by demolishing lots and lots and lots of housing predominated by African American families. Uh, over 8,091 black families in Baltimore were uh, displaced through urban renewal. Uh, Johns Hopkins, one of the big universities in Baltimore, pillar of the community, is famous for its urban renewal efforts and also its demolition and displacement of thousands of African American families. Here you'll see, a, a, um, again, slum clearance plan wins city's highest honor, slum clearance, public health, public safety. Um, Hopkins dome in the background there and a wonderful picture of that first shovel of dirt uh, that's going to uh, displace and replace all the African-American families in the surrounding neighborhood. That didn't stop in 1968 either. We're still seeing significant displacement of African-American families in and around the Hopkins area. This is um, Donald Gresham. Donald Gresham is a, a, a community leader. I know Donald is a great guy of uh, the area around Hopkins called Middle East. Um, and he was really a driving, organizing force in stopping what's called the East Baltimore Development Initiative. Um, and this gentleman right here is the uh, executive director of the East Baltimore, he was the executive director of the East Baltimore Development Initiative. What does this image sort of tell you? Is it actually used quite frequently in Baltimore when you're looking to describe the EBDI development? Anybody? White domination. White domination and telling African American folks what they're gonna do. Um, and that's kind of how EBDI went. Uh, there was some community input 
lots of community input sessions, the kind where you go and they've already drawn up the plans and they listen to you, but not really because they're going to do whatever they want to do. 750 families were displaced uh, so far by EBDI um, and very little replacement um, housing for those folks. What was put in place when you do this uh, slum clearance, when you do the urban renewal? What, what ends up being put in the demolished sites? Anybody know? Oh, come on, this is Harvard. I'm from Baltimore. Parking lots? Parking lots? Yes, parking lots. That's good. Parking lots for what? For uh, commuting uh, people from outside the city. Roads, yes. Okay, roads and public housing. Let's just look at a map of Baltimore, downtown Baltimore. Here's the, uh, how many of you guys have been to Baltimore before? Okay, cool. So how many of you guys have been to the harbor in Baltimore before? Everybody's been to the Inner Harbor, right? You can kind of see the Inner Harbor right here. This is 1959. There's the Inner Harbor. Not really that big a deal. You can't see any of the big power plant. I know that the karaoke bar you went to is not visible in 1959, but it's all neighborhoods, right? After um, urban renewal, this is what Baltimore looks like. 2010, there's the harbor again. There's the nice clean walkways and everything uh, in 2010. And as this gentleman pointed out, what's the biggest noticeable difference? Roads. Roads are a great way to, if you want to separate, you know, downtown from the rest of the city, if you want to displace people, um, roads are a great way to do it. Uh, one particular road that we talk about in Baltimore a lot is this one right here. Um, it's this huge, at this point, it looks like a four-lane sort of interstate, six-lane interstate highway. Uh, we call it the, the road to nowhere. Um, you know, Alaska has the bridge to nowhere. We've got our road to nowhere. Because back in the 70s, they started the road to nowhere with the idea that the road was going to bisect the city and split off down to 95. If you've been to Baltimore, you know that 95 doesn't go through Baltimore City. 95, the big, the big interstate, right? Um, this, the idea was that this is going to go east to west through Baltimore City, through downtown, and out the um, southeast corridor of Baltimore City. Now, when you went to Baltimore City, did you go to Fells Point and Canton? How many of you went to Fells Point or Canton? Anybody? Okay, a few points, yeah. Those are the primarily um, white, used to be working class neighborhoods of Baltimore City. And when the road to nowhere, uh, which displaced 1,000 people in West Baltimore, and by 1,000 people, I mean 1,000 African American families, um, was to head to Southeast Baltimore, um, they, white people had a revolution. They said, no, we're not gonna take it. We're not gonna let you bisect our communities with a giant road like that. Um, and uh, Senator Barbara Mikulski actually led the fight against the highway to nowhere in uh, southeast Baltimore, in Fells Point, Canton. And so uh, that's where she got her political career started. And so, you know, in, in, in West Baltimore, they get a giant road. In East Baltimore, we get a senator. Um, the point is that, you know, if you're looking to divide, this is still a very African-American dominated area of West Baltimore, divided by a, another four-lane road. Actually, it's a six-lane road. You can't really see it here. What do you name the, the big, giant six-lane roads that divide downtown from the, na the, the African-American neighborhood in every city, just about? MLK. MLK Bull, yeah. There we go. So uh, we used the Dr. King's name to uh, create a highway that is actually used to separate you know, poor uh, African-American West Baltimore from the rest of downtown. Uh, now, we need to think, I think, a little bit about who these roads benefited. Who's going to benefit from the roads and the displacement that we're talking about? That's right, uh, white people living in Baltimore County. No one said it, but you were all thinking it. Um, you're right. That's exactly right. Um, and the county did everything it could to stop African Americans from following in, the, in those footsteps of whites getting to Baltimore County. Um, so what did it do? Uh, first, uh, exclusionary zoning. Uh, this little community here in the southeast corner of Baltimore County called Turner Station. Um, the uh, government built a lot of uh, public housing and other housing for African Americans uh, during World War II to house factory workers. The war ended, um, and then suddenly Baltimore County was like, oh crap. There's a lot of black people living here in pristine white Baltimore County. What are we going to do about it? How many of you guys have heard of ex exclusionary zoning? All right, a lot of hands up. Great. So what's exclusionary zoning means? 
What does it mean in this, in this context? What do you think? What do you do when you've got a residential area like this at Turner Station and you don't want that area to get any bigger? Oh, come on, you all raised your hands. There we go, sir. There's the brave bravery. Restrict multifamily housing, restrict any residential housing, right? So Turner Stations actually was rezoned, the area around it, to rezone to commercial and industrial so that you couldn't build any more housing around Turner Station. And that's why you see it's an island of African Americans. It remains that way in 1980. It actually decreases in 1980. And still in 2000, it's an island of African Americans in Baltimore County. Um, the county rejected all public housing. This is one of the largest what we call an entitlement jurisdiction um, in the country to reject all public housing. They didn't build any. They said, no, we don't want the federal government's money to house our neediest citizens. We're going to reject all public housing. Um, there's basically a, a very uh, powerful movement, just like that Senator Mikulski led, uh, to keep out any sort of vouchers or other publicly subsidized housing from Baltimore County for years. There was a, a program called Move to Opportunity um, in the early 90s uh, that was to take folks from the city with vouchers and move them out to opportunity areas in the county. Uh, primarily folks on the east side of the county in the Dundalk, Essex, Rosedale area. They weren't even trying to move folks there, but those people in that neighborhood in particular became so incensed by the idea that you were going to take folks with vouchers from the city and move them to the county that they rose up in mass revolt and the program was basically canned. It went forward, but it was, it was uh, significantly uh, changed. Uh, the one pattern you can see here, and, and if you read uh, Antero Piatilla's book about Baltimore segregation, is the, uh, where the, city, the, the county couldn't exclude African Americans. African Americans did migrate in the pattern of Jewish migration. So you saw a lot of folks of Jewish descent uh, moving into West Baltimore, into the Woodlawn, Pikesville area, and as they move further out, African Americans moved behind them. Um, and so the county channeled development uh, of, of developments for African Americans in that direction. How else? Other zoning issues. On your uh, left, you'll see the ERDL, the Ur Urbal, Ur Urban Rural Demarcation Line. Uh, this was passed in 1967 in Baltimore County, um, and it restricts any sort of multifamily or townhouse development uh, to the area covered in the Ertl. Uh, now, this was, you know, marketed as smart growth. Let's not have suburban sprawl, um, and let's preserve our rural uh, economy and our agriculture. Well, I can tell you right now, there is no farms in this part of Baltimore County. <laughs> this is McMansion Town, okay? Um, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to have multifamily development. Uh, the Ertl also shrank. Uh, you see an article there on the right, apartments limited at Honeygo. Um, you actually see a shrinking of the Ertl when folks don't want any more multifamily uh, housing in, in their particular neighborhood. And Honeygo is right here, right next to I-95. Great access to transportation, great access to good schools. And instead, over time, the county has shrunk the Ertl to prevent any multifamily in those areas. So, put on your thinking caps. Why is that a problem from a fair housing perspective? You may not have taken a fair housing class in your life, but intuitively, what's the problem with shrinking multifamily townhome development to this particular area in the Ertl? Man, everyone told me Harvard Law was brave, that you guys were on the cutting edge and ready to go and Nothing. Wow. Okay. Okay. They restrict the types of people, so the income levels of people that will be able to live in certain areas. So only people that can afford single family homes will be able to live in specific areas. Right. And um, but what? How, how does that have? You're absolutely right. How does that have a fair housing implication? Less access to opportunity, okay. And, and so um, what do you think, given the history of segregation we already talked about, you've talked about with other speakers before me, um, African Americans at this time, are they, have more income or less income than white people? Less 
less income. So not allowing multifamily dwelling building and, and townhouses is going to have a disparate impact on African American families who can't afford the McMansions and the other single family uh, housing in the rest of the county. Um, Baltimore County also uh, very effectively directed all of its uh, subsidized housing into uh, primarily African American and very low income communities. Subsidized housing. So remember, we don't have any public housing. That's out the window. We have other subsidized housing. Now, those of you in the housing world, you know this is low income housing tax credit properties. You know this as Section 8 vouchers. Okay? This map represents uh, every census tract you see there outlined in red is a uh, racially impacted or uh, an area of minority concentration census tract. Again, um, on the west side and then a few um, isolated tracks, there's poor old Turner Station on the east side. Um, and the county deliberately placed all of its uh, low income housing tax credits, hard units, into these racially concentrated uh, census tracts. It also created a voucher program, your Section 8 voucher, that only pays up to a certain amount in rent. Okay? Guess where that rent will buy you an apartment at? West side, east side. Fair market rent's not high enough to get into the white areas in the north and the northeast. So again, when you think about the fact that uh, about 65% of the county's voucher holders are African American, how does that policy have a disparate impact? Well, it impacts where African American voucher holders can live. Um, that too, you know, should be a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Uh, demolished over 4,000 units of uh, affordable and subsidized housing, so not only are we um, uh, channeling where family housing can be built, we're demolishing 4,000 units of subsidized housing. Um, and since 2000, the county has only invested in senior housing. Now, you, again, you don't know Baltimore County, but put on your thinking caps. How do you think that might have a fair housing impact? Take a wild guess. Whew, I'm going to have to talk to your professors, man. They've got to get this Socratic method thing going again. Um, seniors in the county. And seniors, what do you think as a, as a population in the county? Are they mostly white or mostly black? No, seniors are actually mostly white. Families in the county are actually mostly black in the voucher program. Seniors are mostly white. So when you build housing just for seniors, you're benefiting directly white voucher holders in the county and not families that are primarily black in the county. Again, another disparate impact um, of deliberate policies. So um, all these zoning laws, all of these restrictions on subsidized housing, the lack of public housing, you know, Baltimore County has often been described, and some people you know, don't like this, this analogy, but as a noose around the neck of Baltimore City, restricting where folks can move and when into the county. Um, just want to watch a quick um, little movie here, six minutes, uh, and it's from PBS, Race, the Power of an Illusion. And if you ever have a chance, you should really watch the entire thing because it's just the best explanation of segregation in, in, in America that I've seen. Turn it up a little bit. It was a time when hundreds of thousands of GIs came home ready to start families, but had no place to live. In the 1930s, the federal government created the Federal Housing Administration, whose job it was to uh, provide loans or the backing for loans to average Americans so they could purchase a home. Federal programs and banks sank millions into the home construction industry. Their message to veterans, you can afford a new home, buy a new home now. Tax dollars help make the single-family home a mass-produced consumer item. The American dream had a new name, suburbia. We came to Levittown and we found the model house and we walked in and we looked around and uh, of course in the eyes of a 
uh, young man who was raised in the ghetto, so to speak. It was an interesting experience, an interesting lifestyle, seeing all the new modern conveniences. Very fascinating. Eugene Burnett came home with almost a million other black GIs. They had fought for the country in segregated ranks. They returned hoping for equality and the American dream. For many, that dream was a new home for little money down and some of the easiest credit terms in history. I went up to the salesman, we're interested in your home, we're interested in buying one, and uh, what is the procedure? Is there an application to be filled out? So forth. So he looked at me, looked around, and he said to me, he says, listen, it's not me, but the owners of this development have not as yet decided to sell these homes to Negroes. The FHA underwriters warned that the presence of even one or two non-white families could undermine real estate values in the new suburbs. These government guidelines were widely adopted by private industry. Race had long played a role in local real estate practices. Starting in the 1930s, government officials institutionalized the national appraisal system where race was as much a factor in real estate assessment as the condition of the property. Using this scheme, federal investigators evaluated 239 cities across the country for financial risk. So that those communities that were all white, suburban, and far away from minority areas, uh, they received the highest rating, and that was the color green. Those communities that were all minority or in the process of changing, they got the lowest rating and the color red. They were redlined. As a consequence, most of the mortgages went to suburbanizing America, and it suburbanized it racially. As homes in white communities appreciated in value, the net worth of these white families grew. For most non-white families who stayed in urban neighborhoods, the housing market open to them in the 50s and 60s was largely a rental market. You don't gain equity by paying rent. Where one's family lives in America is not just a matter of, of taste and preference. You have the issue of housing and wealth. The majority of Americans hold most of their wealth in the form of home equity. So that's their nest egg. That's how they can finance the education of their offspring. That's how they can um, sort of save up for retirement. Um, it's their savings bank, right? They're living in their savings bank. My family, like a lot of families, was in Detroit struggling to buy a house. You had a dual housing market, one white, one black. A housing market with one with a lot of demand, another housing market with very little demand. My father lives in the house that I grew up in. The house today, five bedroom house, is worth about $20,000. The same house bought in the suburbs would be worth today about $320,000. So whites moving to the suburb were being subsidized in the accumulation of wealth, while blacks were being divested. And these were public policy decisions in which, on one hand, people were given access to property, um, given title, and subsequently wealth. And on another hand, where people were not given access to property, did not generate wealth, and did not generate the kind of opportunity for the next generation.
I don't know how we got off track there, but. Okay, so um, this is, well, you know what this is, right? This is a red line map of Baltimore. Same thing around the country happening in Baltimore. Remember the African American neighborhoods where the public housing was located? See any, any overlap? Racially restricted covenant neighborhoods up here, over here. Um, you know, it, we have to keep moving, we're almost out of time. But I just want to emphasize the one point that I think gets lost a lot is that when whites left, property values plummeted because it's a market. It operates on supply and demand. If whites are 80% of the market, suddenly they've all left uh, because you have blockbusting realtors saying, hey, you better sell your house now because once the first black family moves in, your house is going to tank. They moved. And uh, we built a lot of great roads for them to move out on. And then you only have 20% of the market now going for the same house, much less demand. Housing prices tank. The tax base is decimated. Okay? 6%. Anybody know what this figure is in this context? The average wealth of African Americans compared to um, white families. So African Americans have 6% uh, of the average wealth of the white families today. That's today. Why? Well, African Americans were excluded from the greatest um, wealth-building activity of the 20th century, home ownership. Today, only 47% of African Americans own their houses, 72% uh, for whites. Looking at that, that, that really quickly and, and how it plays out still in uh, the area where Freddie Gray was from, Sandtown, Winchester, uh, the area where the uprising started. Um, then you compare that to uh, Guilford Homeland, which was one of the racially restricted covenant areas. You can see how that plays out. If we can hold all questions for the end, um, but in terms of percent African-American, in terms of life expectancy, household income, uh, vacant housing units, real quick, 18.7% of the housing is vacant compared to 2%. Um, and then you throw in um, unemployment rate of 30% among African-Americans, and you can see how we've created a racialized cycle of poverty. Um, again, just going on to the, the maps of today and, and speaking specifically about Sandtown Winchester right here. Um, again, very eerily similar to both our red line maps um, and our racially restricted covenant maps. Still, African Americans clustered on the west side of Baltimore and in the Middle East area over here. Um, and so, you know, the past is not, is not even past. Um, it's still here. It's still present. The policies that we put in place that kind of ended in 1968, but not really, are still around. Um, so summing up, we're talking about all areas of government, federal, state, um, city government, enacting deliberate policies, first to quarantine black families into specific um, ghetto areas, uh, to tear down huge amounts of African American housing, replace it with roads and segregated public housing. Uh, the roads help white people to escape to a county that does everything within its power to reject African Americans through a series of zoning rules um, and rejection of all subsidized housing. We give white people the key to the middle class through home ownership, um, and again, while confining blacks to areas with an eroding tax base, unemployment, and schools that are way under-resourced. Um, today, we wring our hands and we say, oh, why, oh, dear, how does this happen? Maybe it's because too many African-American youths are, are wearing their pants too low. Come on. That's ridiculous. This is the product of deliberate government policies that have played out over the past 100 years, really the past 400 years. Um, and even assuming that, you know, de jure segregation ended in 1970 or 80, which we know it didn't. We talked about how Baltimore County is continuing these policies today. Um, I, you know, going back to Ta-Nehisi Coates again, if you kick somebody on the sidewalk till they're bloody, and then you stop and you say to them, okay, I stopped, now we're even, you're not even. You've created a racialized cycle of poverty. You're very far from even. So now that you're all thoroughly depressed and appalled and outraged, um, let's talk about some of the advocacy opportunities that are available to try to change this. Um, and the first is the advocacy of opportunity, opportunity areas. You can see on the map there, 
uh, the lowest opportunity to the highest opportunity in deep red. Um, so the opposite of a redlining map. Red actually means good. Um, yellow means lower op lowest opportunity. As you can see, the highest opportunity areas are still in the north and northeast of the county, kind of the southwest of Baltimore County, the racially restricted zones in Baltimore City. Um, and then this over here is Howard County, which is in the top five wealthiest counties in the country. What's the idea between opportunity-based advocacy? Well, it's person-based advocacy. It's how do we um, ha help folks who are poor, who are primarily African-American in the city, get access to opportunity areas. Uh, a colleague at the ACLU, Barbara Samuels, um, who was the person who was invited to speak to you today, so it's not her, my fault that I'm here, it's her fault. Um, <laughs> she was the lead counsel on a, a case called Thompson v. Hud. Thompson v. Hud in the 1990s is, I think, the most successful fair housing litigation in the country. Uh, filed against Hud for, remember that 1968 law about affirmatively furthering fair housing, what HUD's supposed to do? Well, they didn't do that in Baltimore, it's clear, right? And so, uh, ACLU filed suit against uh, HUD and they won an amazing settlement. They've moved 3,100 uh, folks from public housing in Baltimore City, vast majority African American, into opportunity areas, the red and the orange areas here on the map, with vouchers. Uh, they're planning to do another 1,400 in the next couple years. Um, so that is, uh, you know, a, a, it, it, that, that is a big deal. It is a major opportunity for those 5,000 or so families that are getting to participate in this program. Um, I'm co-counsel on a case with Barbara uh, that involves a complaint against Baltimore County. So all the different um, zoning policies and practices we talked about, uh, we filed a HUD complaint um, in the heady days of 2011 and the, the era of hope and change um, against Baltimore County. Um, four and a half years later, we're still in the HUD complaint uh, labyrinth, but, but you know, I, 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 I hope for good things and I expect good things to come out of that. What does it mean, though? It means mobility counseling. It means helping people, give people a voucher, tell them, look, you need to use this voucher in opportunity areas. We're going to give you help to find the right area for your family that it meets your transportation needs, that meets your education needs, that meets your employment needs, giving them help with the security deposit, giving them help with moving expenses, basically everything that they need to move to the area that they choose um, that falls within the, the opportunity areas to make up for the past uh, segregation and discrimination. Um, other parts of uh, the fair housing based on opportunity, banning source of income. So source of income is a lot of landlords don't take vouchers. I think in Massachusetts you've already banned source of income. In Baltimore County it's alive and well and a lot of landlords won't take vouchers. So we need a banned source of income. These are the kinds of advocacy opportunities that you can see uh, when you're doing legal work. Is it enough? No way. There are 22,000 children under, the year, uh, uh, under six years old who are living in Baltimore City uh, who are living in extreme poverty. 22,000. And we got 5,000 vouchers done. And that's considered the biggest success in the country. That's, that's where we are. The other, um, that's called a, considered a person-based advocacy. The other area where a lot of lawyers are involved are in place-based advocacy. How do we direct more resources to the neighborhoods that have been um, excluded from development, that have been redlined, that have been left out of these, these home ownership, wealth building activities? Because we put a lot of money into downtown Baltimore. We put tons and tons of tax money and tons and tons of credits um, and focus on downtown Baltimore while um, our housing suffers from blight and vacancy. Uh, one model that we're involved in is called a community land trust. It's where the uh, community owns the land and then leases it with a 99-year renewable ground lease. Uh, you have in this, in, in Boston, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, if you're interested in this model, fantastic uh, model for how a community land trust should work because it include, the, the, the community land trust is run by the community. The board is comprised of community residents, neighborhood residents, uh, public policy officials who can plan in a democratic way for what kind of housing we need and how, what kind of rec centers we need and what kind of educational opportunities we need and then implement that in a way that the community always owns the land and can use the restrictions in the 99 year lease to control um, who has access. So for instance, you sell the, 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 the home to somebody at 
30% of area median income, let's say $30,000, uh, when they sell it, they have to resell it to someone who makes $30,000. So you create permanently affordable housing. Now that person's still gonna build equity, they're still gonna build wealth because they're gonna get a mortgage, just like everybody else. They're gonna pay down the mortgage and that principal is gonna be their equity and they'll get a share of appreciation too. But we're running short on time. Uh, this is our big report. If you're interested, I'll give you the, the website. We just released it last week. Um, I wanna give special thanks to Dr. Lawrence Brown from Morgan State University who allowed me to use some of the images here. If you're a Twitter person, uh, Dr. Brown's an amazing tweeter. I don't even know if that's the right word, but he's at Be More Doc. ACO of Maryland allowed me to use some of their images. And again, the United Workers and the Baltimore Housing Roundtable. If you want to access the report, it's at baltimorehousingroundtable.org. And I'll just add Peter Sabonis from uh, National Economic Social Rights Initiative, as well as Jeff Singer from the University of Maryland. So thank you. Sure. That's okay with you, Matt? Yeah. We have a microphone for, for questions. Hi. Is this, is this on? Okay, great. Um, so I was curious about, so I'm actually from Baltimore County. Um, hey. And yeah, so there are people from Baltimore at Harvard. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, but I, um, I was curious about, I. I'm from probably like the Towson area, so this is probably more northern in Baltimore County. And, the pro and there's a lot of Section 8 housing in some portions, and the rent is really high there, and the property values are so high there, so that even if people move to those areas, there's no, I don't think that right now there doesn't really exist a path to actually obtaining home ownership in the same neighborhoods that they make their home. So I'm wondering what type of mm. advocacy of opportunity you are thinking of, considering to actually make what you said about like um, the majority of African American families were basically displaced from the opportunity to own houses. Mm. What basically what's the path to actually making that possible? That's a really great point. You know, a lot most of the advocacy we're doing around um, opportunity and moving folks into opportunity areas is based on rental. It's giving somebody a voucher, um, and there are landlords and there are apartments within HUD's fair market rent in Towson. Um, there aren't as many and the county can raise its payment standards so that voucher holders have access to more units, but that doesn't get to the home ownership uh, piece of this. I mean, there is a home ownership component to the Section 8 program um, so that you can kind of convert your rental into home ownership after building up some, some money for a down payment. It's very uh, poorly used. Um, it's, it, it's not really a, an opportunity for folks. I mean, I think that that's a real hole in our advocacy. Um, and I think that'd be a great thing to, to explore more because the home ownership opportunities that are being uh, promoted right now are generally within, again, this kind of place-based, how do we transform entire neighborhoods um, into being places of opportunity. Yes, sir. I just wondered where, uh, where, you, where your organization gets the money. To do what? Uh, well, to, for the uh, for security deposits, moving expenses. Sure. Uh, so in, in the is this, is this uh, nonprofit money or is this mm -hmm. uh, tax money? How, how do you get funded? Sure. In the Thompson, the Thompson case, which is, again, I'm sorry, I'm not with the ACLU. I'm with Public Justice Center. But ACLU, again, sued HUD um, and the money for the mobility program that placed, you know, 3,100 came from HUD. So in other words, the government settled with the ACLU and the government pays for the mobility program, pays for the security deposits, et cetera. Mm -hmm. From a policy matter, how do you deal with the need to create continuously affordable housing and balance that with the need to grow equity? It's a great question. Um, you know, there are a lot of different financing mechanisms we're exploring. For instance, in the Community Land Trust report, I referenced um, the group that we're working with called the Baltimore Housing Roundtable is calling on the city to float $20 million in general obligation bonds to do community land trust housing, which again, you still build equity. You as the owner still get a mortgage, you're still paying down the mortgage, you're gonna build equity, but the land stays with the community and becomes permanently affordable. Um, and then $20 million to do vacant demolition because we have a huge problem with vacants in Baltimore, about 30,000 vacants. Um, there's all sorts of creative ways to try to find money like that. There's affordable housing trust funds 
I think in, um, in what is it, LA, they're exploring doing a tax on Airbnb, um, deed and recordation taxes to fund the trust fund. Um, none of these are enough, though. I mean, you know, in some ways, when you look at the stats and when you look at the need, they're a drop in the bucket. So how do we really bring these things to scale um, is a real question that I struggle with every day. Um, I have a question regarding some of the solutions you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So um, with regards to um, some of the solutions regarding home equity, um, are you confident that that would close the wealth gap? Um, because from my perspective, it seems like it might slow, the, I guess, the exacerbation of the wealth gap, but it won't necessarily decrease the wealth gap itself because these FHA policies that you've been talking about mm -hmm. have been going on since the 30s. So a lot of these white families that have now moved to the suburbs, they've gotten such a head start and their property values are so much higher relative mm -hmm. to the property values and the programs you're talking about. Yep. So even if they appreciate, they won't appreciate to the same extent as um, properties in the suburbs. And that's just gonna exacerbate the wealth gap. Um, I mean, possibly. Uh, you know, there is a movement back to the city. And I think Boston is, is from what I'm told, a really great example of folks moving back and gentrifying the city, and now city values actually increasing far greater than suburban home values. So I, I don't know, you know to the extent that's true or not, but uh, you tell me, you live in Boston, so how bad I is it out there? I just moved here. Oh, okay. I've heard the rents are too damn high. Yes, they are. Okay, so, so that, that's definitely a problem. I, you know, I, I, there's no magic silver bullet. Um, you raise an important point, are the inequities that we're facing so overwhelming that even these strategies are nothing. Um, I don't know. I think you know, the, the best uh, strategies that we have right now and the ones we're pursuing, I am not affiliated with any political party or candidate, but in some ways, we need a political revolution that's really going to direct the kind of wealth we're talking about to do these kinds of strategies. Yeah, uh, I kind of have two questions. The first is, there does seem to be a bit more of awareness about these sorts of issues, particularly. Uh, I'm wondering like what you, I don't know if you can say this, but kind of what you think of HUD under the new leadership and whether you think that it's a willing partner or you're just gonna have to continue to push, 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 push mm -hmm. um, because they're not gonna really do anything unless budge. And kind of related to that, I wonder, um, you know, I'm a law student, there are a lot of law students in here figuring out like how best to change things like this, you know, do you think that kind of the more direct legal services route and impact litigation is more impactful than trying to reform, you know, the uh, policy and government system, or do you think, or do you think there's one that's more impactful than the other? Um, so first question, HUD, um, you know, I think HUD's moving in the right direction. I think they're trying to support a lot of the opportunity-based advocacy that, that we're talking about when we talk about opportunity areas. Um, I think that, you know, I've been really impressed with some of the folks higher up at HUD um, and when they're talking about where they want to go and what they want to do. Um, it hasn't always translated into concrete action on the local level. Um, and I think that's a matter of uh, resources, I think, and focus, uh, that HUD needs to bring in more resources and more focus to really uh, translate what they want to do into a real concrete solution. Um, in terms of, of what's more impactful, direct service or, or policy advocacy, I think you can do both. I think both are extremely important. I mean, I do, I do both in my job. So I have individual clients um, and we do, I'm in red court just grinding out, you know, these awful cases with landlords trying to pull the wool over and charge all these crazy illegal fees. And then I go into the, you know, the General Assembly in Maryland sometimes and push for laws that try to address the practices I'm seeing on the ground. So I think you need both because you can't be up there doing the, the policy advocacy without really knowing what's going on on the ground. So everybody's gotta be a part of that. We've got time for one more question. I, I just wonder, are there lawsuits in progress to uh, remove these restrictive housing uh, policies in uh, the uh, areas in Baltimore County? In the county? So, so as, I, as I alluded to, I'm co-counsel on a, a HUD complaint. It's not a lawsuit, but it's an administrative complaint filed with HUD 
that um, addresses a lot of these names, all of the different practices that I named in the PowerPoint. Um, and we've been in conciliation, so um, sitting down with the county and HUD for the past four and a half years. Uh, are you familiar with mediation? mediation? It's pretty much mediation. mediation. It's a federal, no, it's actually the HUD um, Fair Housing Office Chief for Baltimore, who was our primary mediator, and, and now the regional chief is our mediator. But yes, so that's, it's not quite as structured as, as um, uh, some of the mediation programs that are in st uh, regulation. Why, why is it taking so long? Are there any time no, um, I mean there are, but they can always be waived, and all of them have been waived. Um, so I couldn't. I I don't know why it's taking so long. I think it's a matter of focus and resources, um, and I hope. I think we're going to get there really soon. Please join me in thanking Matt. Matt thank you very much. Yep. Thank you.